So I'm Dr. Raymond Doyle. I'm a geologist. A bit more specifically, I'm the geopark geologist. Uh, so every geopark has to have a geologist associated with it to, you know, because it's all about, not all about geology, but all, a lot about geology. So we have to have a, ge uh, a geopark geologist, and that's me. But more specifically, uh, I'm actually a paleontologist. So while I'm interested in all aspects of geology and sedimentology, my particular interest and speciality is paleontology. So I study fossils. So my job is to, as all geologists, we study the history of the Earth. So the history in particular of life on Earth is recorded in the rocks. And that's what a paleontologist does. We find fossils and we see what that means for that particular age rock and what was going on at that particular time. So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the new fossils that I've been discovering in this general area within the geopark. So new fossil discoveries tell us about the biodiversity of ancient life in the Clare Shales. It's a bit of a mouthful, but different fossils, new information in some of the rocks around here. That's what we're going to be talking about. So the geological context, I'm not going to talk too much about the overall geology. I do that in other talks and presentations, but just to say where we're talking about. So this is a geological map. This is the geopark boundary around here. First thing to notice actually is we've got two main units. We've got the kind of bluey stuff up here, and then we've got the kind of browns and reddish down here. So the geology of the area can be divided into two main groups. So we've got our limestone, which is the blue stuff, our sandstone and shale, which is the brown colors. I'm gonna be talking about this particular unit here. So I'm gonna ignore the limestone, pretty much. I'm gonna mention it once, but pretty much just gonna be talking about everything down here. All these, the sandstone and shale. We call it sandstone and shale because there's different layers in that unit, and they're just repeated sequences of sandstone, shale, sandstone, and shale. So this is some of our brown area here. This is the Cliffs of Moher, obviously exposed on the coast here. Inland, so in the limestone area, we can see the rock. We know where the limestone is. You just have to look out your door, look out your window, and the limestone is there. It's not so easy down here. It's mostly fields, bogs, forestry, whatever. But we know on the coast we can see, and the Cliffs of Moher, one of the reasons why it's so special is because you get spectacular exposures of these sandstones and shales. But anywhere in around here, underneath there, that's exactly what you're going to find. So that geological map is telling you what's in here. So anywhere south of Kilfenora, south of Listoon, Varan, up around here, that's the kind of rock you're going to see. So everything in there, that's what you're looking at. I'm in particular looking at the shales. Why would I do that? Well, the shale is a very soft, crumbly rock. Those of you who have put it out on paths or roads or whatever, you know, after a couple of years, it, it kind of disintegrates. Um, and here's just a close-up version. Here's some of the sandstones. They're rigid, they're fairly solid, they last a bit longer. The shale is the bit in between. So it's a darker layers, but it's softer. It weathers over time. I look at the shales because shales are made of mud. Shales are mud that has been turned to rock. And because they're made of mud, they're very, very fine-grained. So when fossils are preserved in the fine-grained material, you get good detail preserved. You do get fossils in the sandstones. Generally speaking, not always, generally speaking, they're not as well preserved because it doesn't have the fine detail preserved. It's like making a mold or a cast of anything. The finer the material used, the better the details you'll get preserved. So that's why I look at the shales. Um, and now we know why, uh, why these birds come to Cliff some more, because obviously they're there looking for fossils too. Now, a lot of the exposures are in places like this, which I can't get to. So I'm kind of going around looking for small bits of exposures and finding shales uh, and getting to them before they weather away completely. So there's a kind of a window of opportunity I have. When a piece of shale is out in the atmosphere, it breaks down fairly quickly. And in, uh, after it, it varies, the thinner it is, the faster it'll disintegrate. So I put out some bits of shale and come back in a month or two and they're pretty much crumbled to pieces. Bigger pieces last a couple of years. So there's kind of a wind of opportunity I have between finding the piece with the fossil in it and when that all disintegrates, including the fossil and they disintegrate as well. Now, the age of these rocks. Here is a geological time period scale. Um, all the different periods have got different names. The one we're interested in here is the Carboniferous. All the rocks in this part of Clare are Carboniferous age rocks. The limestone has an age of about 330 million years old. On average, some is a little bit older, some is a little bit younger, depends on what layer you're in. The rocks we're looking at, the sandstone shale, are sitting on top of the limestone, so they're a little bit younger. 
Now, if you say that 330 million years old, nobody's going to argue with you. But if you want to be a little bit more precise, 321-ish to 315-ish million years. So a little bit younger than the limestone because they sit on top. So that's the age pretty much of everything I'm going to be looking at today. So the rocks are that age. That means the fossils that you find inside them are that age as well. So if you happen to be out and about and you pick a bit of shale and you find a fossil in it, you can tell without even calling me, you can tell that's the age of the fossils in there, OK? Now, 320, 330 million years, it's a long, long time ago, and an awful lot can happen in that period of time. But if you look at the age of the Earth, this is 4.6 billion years old, so 4,600 million years old. This represents less than 10% of the time scale of the history of the world, the history of Earth, right? So we're only in the top bit. Uh, so you say, well, it's not that old. But when we're talking about fossils, really, most of the fossils that we, we find are about this age here, so 550 million years old. So before that, there's very little life and very little preserved in fossils. So really, we're, we're kind of midway through the succession, the evolution of life on Earth when we're looking at the fossils in the rocks here. So we started off with simple forms, then they evolved, evolved, evolved. So we're halfway along that journey to get to where we are today. With all the life that's on Earth today, that all started way back down here. Well, actually, some of it started this age. But we started to really diversify by this time. So some of the stuff we'll be looking at today, there are representatives of those stuff still alive today, not the same species. Some of them um, have gone extinct. So there's a variety of all the different branches of life, but we're just one, this, the rocks we have here is kind of a snapshot through the middle of the history of life on Earth. So previously in the Clare Shales, um, people have worked on the Clare Shales for, you know, best part of 100 years. Um, and really what they were looking at initially, starting back in the 1950s, there was really a lot of work done on the ammonoids. These are these spiral shells, and in some layers in the shales, there are millions of them. Some layers, not so many. And the reason they were looking at those is because these evolve very rapidly. So some ammonoids have a particular kind of uh, ornament, a particular kind of body shape, and then the next layer up, they're a little bit different, and the next layer up a little bit different, and the next layer up a little bit different. A lot of the original work for this was done in the UK, uh, similar age stuff. Uh, and then when people found the same kind of fossils here, they, we could compare them across and say, ah, that's the age these are. And this is basically what they were looking at. They were coming up with names and associations of these fossils and saying, this is this particular horizon. If you find these ones, it's this particular horizon. If you find these ones, it's this particular horizon. So it's a way of dating the rocks, telling where you were in the, the sequence. And that was very important to tell us what was going on. Um, so it gets very technical, um, and I'm not really going to talk about that anymore, but just to say that's where most of the attention has been on up to now, has been on getting this, the layering, the strigraph right, using these fossils. And what it meant was a lot of the other stuff uh, was ignored. Now, the other stuff is with all those ammonoids we have, there's plenty of them, we also have some orthocones. Now, there's a bit of work done on these the turn of the last century. Um, these are basically straight shelled versions of these. So these are coiled. If you uncoil that, you get at this. They're both um, cephalopods. There's also some bivalves, a variety of different forms of bivalves. They look quite different. This one looks pretty much like a scallop. They were thin and flat. These ones look a bit more like mussel shells. Um, there's lots of plants as well, bits and pieces of plant. But in the past, when people have been looking at the rocks, they've kind of said, yeah, there's some bivalves. That's it. There's bits of plant, that's it. They, nobody photographed them even, nobody published pictures of them. They were really, really ignored, just kind of, yeah, left aside. They're not important because they weren't useful for the biostratigraphy, so they were kind of ignored. Until about, what was it, 2015 or so, when um, Barham and Murray up at University College Galway, um, they published something on these conodonts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the conodonts in a bit. Uh, and that was the first attempt, really, to look at something else in the, in the fauna in these, in these rocks. Now, a number of years back, when I started working here, that was the kind of story I had kind of presented to me. And in a few years, I found one of these things. And this is what kicked off all the new stuff that I've found since then. I found a shark's tooth. This is what this is. It's a chondrichthyan. We just call him shark. Um, this is about two centimeters in size. And it was the first time anybody had found anything like that, that certainly that size, in, in the Clare Shales. So, that set off a kind of a, a thought process saying, well, if we're getting sharks, if the tooth is that size, the shark is that size. If we've got sharks that size, there must be more 
to the, the environment, to the, the biodiversity that was going on at that time. Because if you're getting sharks, that kind of implies a lot of other things that would have been living there as well. So it kind of, I guess it opened my eyes and um, I started finding other things then. Um, now, crinoids were known before. Again, they were kind of dismissed. People said, yeah, there's fossil crinoids there. And then I started looking closely. Sorry? Yep. Crinoids are, this is kind of, crinoids are, are creatures. They're animals. They look like plants and they have a stem. And this is, the, the stem is made up of little pieces of, you know, little discs that stack on top of each other. And we're looking down at one of those discs there now. And then this is another bit here. This is the head of a crinoid. It's lying on its side. So you've got a stalk like this and you've got a head and it kind of waves in the sea. They're still alive today. Um, and they, they gather their food directly from the sea and then They've got all these arms here to collect the food that goes down in here. So this is a section across one of these stems. And by looking at some of the detailed pictures here, I worked with uh, my colleague in the, in the UK, and we decided it was a, a new species. Not only that, a new, a new genus as well. So we called it Heloamba columbus harpori. Uh, so that uh, is from the Doolin area, and it's a species that is only known. It's this, it's this 320 million years old, and it's only known uh, from Doolin. So a new genus, a new species. So that, you know, the more you look, the more you find. Um, so we've got this new type of crinoid. Then I found these bones. Again, these are small bones. And working with Adon O'Gogon, um, who's now in the Natural History Museum in Dublin, um, we published a paper on these and interpret them as tetrapod bones. So they would have belonged to a creature, something like this. Now, there are older tetrapods in Ireland, the Devonian um, footprints down in Valencia Island, but it was the first time we'd come across something like this in, in Clare. Um, so we got a lot of publicity about that, which was great. So again, it's telling us there's more going on in the Clare Shales. This particular thing here, I'm going to get back to this in a second. Um, that was found up in the Cliffs of Moher by Cormac McGinley when he worked there. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then the other new stuff I've got is these burrows. These are in the limestone. That's the only mention I'm going to make of the limestone. These are in the limestone just below the shale, so they're close to the shale, and I'm going to talk in these. The reason I'm just putting these up here quickly, these are all published. So I've done the research in those uh, with, other, with colleagues. They're all published. So this is new stuff that's already published. What I'm going to be talking from now on after this is stuff that hasn't even been published yet, so it's really new. This is literally just out this year, a couple of months ago. Um, it's online. The paper version isn't even out yet. I um, worked with this with, with John Murray and a couple of other authors, John, up in the University of Galway. Cormac found this about 10 years ago, and he entrusted it to me to figure out what it was. Um, and we, we basically did in the end. It took us a very long time because there's nothing else like this in the world. It's as simple as that. We have spent the last 10 years trying to find comparative material, all ages, all across the globe. Couldn't do it. It's about this big in diameter. Um, and one of the interesting things has got these nodes around it, and there's eight of them. Eightfold symmetry is quite uncommon in, in the fossil world, in the animal world, and generally can be associated with corals and, crin uh, corals and jellyfish and those kind of creatures, and enemies as well. So our final interpretation of it was that it is, this is actually the base of it, so that's actually upside down. We're looking at the base of a burrowing sea anemone. So again, um, that's published in an international journal. It's of international importance, but again, it's so unique that um, it, was, it was difficult to figure out what it was. So the only one of its kind, and that was found um, in one of the quarries um, at the Cliffs Moor. And there's other burrows here. Again, this is published as well uh, in an international journal. Um, these are burrows in the limestone. They've been infilled with other sediment. They're just, because the sediment that filled them in was different to the one that was already there, they stand out really well. Um, and this was basically, imagine somewhere like the Bahamas, very shallow seafloor. These creatures were living in the mud on the seafloor, burrowing in to the sediment, um, just like this. We think it was probably shrimp. We don't find the animal inside it. Very often you don't with burrows like that. Um, but shrimp were around at that time, and they would have been creatures big enough to, to, to dig into, make burrows. They're about that wide, that kind of size. So burrowing, and again, silenicness is what we called it, and this is the oldest um, form of this anywhere in the world. And again, that was published in the International Journal. So there's lots of new stuff and lots of it has already been published. Um, so on to some of the newer stuff. I'm just going to skip that for a second. Let's go to the very latest discovery. When I say very latest, I mean last Sunday morning. I got up early, 
bright sun, whatever. I got up, I was up and I was just looking at some stuff I'd put aside, you know, I've got a collection of stuff. And I was looking at this and I was going, oh wow, okay. And the way I put the light on it under the microscope, it just jumped out at me that this is something new and interesting. So I'm just gonna throw it out there. Anybody got any ideas what this is? Broadly, in the, in the widest possible term. Fish? No, but we will get onto fish. Bird. Not a bird, it's not fish. Insect, jellyfish, no, and look at the scale. This is millimeters, by the way, so it's quite small. It's actually a bit of plant. So we have fossil plants. This is a bit of plant, and what's really interesting about this are these two areas here. These are, let me just go on to the next one, the ovules of a fossil seed fern. So these are the ovules here. There's these little things coming out of them, um, and these, they think, were for Possibly there's a couple of interpretations of what these are. These are for uh, trapping the pollen, which is going to come down and fertilize these and they grow into seeds, or they're for dispersing in the wind. There's a lot of debate about it. But the main point is that these are the precursors, essentially. Uh, th this, is, this would have grown into be a, a seed, so these are the precursors of, of flowers. There's an awful lot of debate about flowers. You know, the burn is famous for its modern flowers. But um, in the fossil world, paleontologically, fossils are a bit difficult because the oldest known one currently is only 130 million years old. These rocks, as we said, are about 320 million years old. So there's 200 million years of a gap. And some of this stuff they've done with you know, the molecular stuff, and they've said, look, the, the earliest fossil should be around that age. But nobody's really found it yet. So there's a lot of debate going on. These things are very rare. So finding these is... Um, is, is very new. I'm working with um, a colleague who's in the University of Liège in Belgium, who is a bit of an expert on these, and, and he confirmed what it was, um, and you know, we're gonna do a bit of work on this and see how important it is. It's just one, but it's the ovules of a fossil seed fern. And this is a seed fern here. Seed ferns, they look exactly like ferns. You find bits and pieces of these in the rocks, but they're not actually ferns that we call ferns today, because ferns today don't produce seeds these things did. So again, you have to remember where we were geological time, we're back 300 million years ago. Things hadn't quite got sorted themselves out, if you like, to where we are today. So some of the plants, uh, like ferns, they looked like ferns, but something happened in, the, you know, in evolution and the, things went different routes to get to where we are today. So this is just a, a part of that story. This is a part of the evolution of flowers on Earth, the angiosperms. So these are all gymnosperms, you know, pine sort of group, angiosperms are the flowering plants. So this is kind of, uh, was it a, a gymnosperm? Was it the start of being an angiosperm? Where did it happen? Nobody knows the answer yet, um, but this is part of the story. So it's good to have. Where did you find that? Where did I find that? In my kitchen. <laughs> Literally, I opened up a box, I put stuff away. Um, I, what I tell you, um, it's in the sandstone sheds. I don't give out specific information. Um, because there are so few locations and if people start going there and collecting them, uh, we lose information. But. I showed you the map, all my stuff comes from really close by, where those sandstones and shales are, it's in there, in there somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You can, it's not always easy. Um, now, we do find terrestrial plant material, and we find them side by side with the marine. So you might find an ammonoid right beside here. Ammonoids are purely marine. You find the two of them mixed up. So you're gonna go, hang on, is it terrestrial, is it marine? Is it? Well, in fact, what we have here is stuff being washed in from the land and being deposited in the sea. So these sandstones and shales at the Cliffs of Moher, the sand part are kind of these flood events. So we've got massive rivers, eroding mountains, distant mountains, and they're carrying all this sand and mud. And when there's a flood, at that time we were down near the equator. So we're, there was monsoonal events happen every year, just like today in, the, in Asia. Um, so these brought lots of rain, flushing down mountains, washing it out, and these debauched out into the sea. So all this, you know, when a river is flowing, it'll rip up whatever is in the neighborhood, uh, plants and animals as well and they get washed out to sea. And then the muddy stuff settles slowly and maybe drifts off a little bit further. So the sand is kind of gets deposited first into mouth bars and stuff in a delta. The fine mud settles a little bit further offshore. And these things could float a little bit, you know, until they got waterlogged. And we find like these as well, these come from land as well. They would just float a little bit offshore and then settle down when they got waterlogged. So that's why you get the two of them mixed together. 
Right, that was number one, new plant, very interesting. Conodonts, I mentioned them briefly earlier. Usually, they've been known for a long time and people didn't quite know what they were. They were still very useful because, again, like the ammonoids, they change over time. So people were using them for biostratigraphy, telling us what age the horizon was in by looking at the fine details in them. And generally what they did was they get lumps of rock and they dissolve it in acid. And these things, because they're hydroxyapatite, they don't dissolve in acid and they're left behind. And you can pick them out and say, yeah, this is what we got. I didn't do that with these. I was just opening up rocks, looking at them very closely, and I found them in the shales. So they're interesting in that we've got conodonts. And I said, the work that John Murray and others have done, we know a little bit about the conodonts already. So they're interesting, but eh, maybe not too interesting. But then what happened was I started finding clusters of them. So when you dissolve the rock in acid, you just get individual bits and pieces. You don't know how to put them together because they're just all jumbled up. When you find clusters of them together, that's telling you when the animal died, those are the pieces that were left there. So this is kind of an, an imprint or a, a, the remains of an animal that just died in place. All the soft body is gone. That gets eaten by bacteria, removed by predators, whatever, dissolves away and the hard bits get left behind. And when they're just left like that in place, you can then reconstruct that and say, ah, this was here, this was here, this was here, more or less. And what people have done then is reconstruct the apparatus. So these things, the conodonts, are actually the mouth parts of these extinct creatures. They're no longer around. Uh, most people believe they were very early chordates. So they were just the beginning of you know, creatures having a backbone, um, but they can, reconstruct them to give this complex mouth parts. So the individual bits that we look at are parts of a structure. Generally, there's about 16 or 18 of these in the mouth part of these things. These are tiny. Each one of these is only about a millimeter or two long. So when you find clusters of them like that, it can give you a lot more information about the creatures that were there. So that is going to be useful. And I'm going to be working with John Murray and one of his students um, on kind of deciphering our, our new ones here. But there's more. This is what conodonts look like. There's been reconstructions. Only two, so when you get the soft body preserved, and when I show this to kids in school, they love it. The reaction is great. Yeah. Um, but the, um, for an awful long time, people didn't quite know what those things were. Then about 20 years ago, uh, somebody found one with some of the soft body preserved. And there's only 12 in the world bits with soft body preserved. So people are kind of reconstructed from that. They think there's eyes. They found muscles and stuff, so the bit of a tail. So they reconstruct. They're only a few centimeters long. I think the biggest is about 12 centimeters long, but most of them are much smaller than that. So they're tiny little things. And this is the mouth here. And that structure that I just showed, they reckoned that this was kind of an extensible thing that you could, they could extend out and maybe grab what was there and retract it in again. So alien kind of stuff. But yeah, this is what was living in our seas uh, 320 million years ago. And they were quite abundant in parts. But beyond that, beyond finding them you know, together like that, I've also found this. This doesn't look like much at all. This is actually a cluster of lots and lots of bits of conodonts. So there's way more here than you'd expect for one individual who just died. There's lots of individuals here together. So we've got this cluster with, you know, there's over 100 individual pieces in this. This is just a, a piece of the slab. So that's something even newer and even more interesting because the only way, how are you going to get a cluster of all these bits uh, together in one place like that? When the animals die on the seafloor, they just leave individuals. And in so to get them all mixed up like this in one thing, um, what we're actually looking at here is these are conodonts that have been eaten. So something has come along, and e despite the fact that these things are extremely hard, you know, they had some muscle in them, and these things are extremely sharp and pointy. Uh, so I'm not calling this a coprolite. And again, I haven't done all the work on this yet. Coprolite is when you eat it and it passes out the other end, and you get what's left behind. Don't think these, but some of these things are very delicate and spiky. So this is what we call a regurgitite. So the fish take the stuff in, they process, get the, and then they basically spew it out again, the bits they can't digest. You know, and fish do that, uh, other, other creatures do it as well, and you know, sometimes we even do it. But, so we think, and this is exceptionally, exceptionally rare, but I do advise don't, don't eat conodonts. Um, so yeah, exceptionally rare. When I say exceptionally rare, of course, never found in Ireland before, not just here, not just Ireland, and very rare globally. So again, this is significant. It hasn't been written up yet, so I can only say so much about it, but internationally significant. Conodonts, new to most of you. Gastropods, snails. Again, they hadn't been recorded in the this, in this shales before either. So again, millimeters, you know, this is relatively small, but it's definitely a snail. So again, they're rare. Why is that? 
we have to kind of figure out, you know, they're very common in the limestone. They're not common in the shales. Most of these snails, we think, were grazers, so they were going along the sediment floor, eating algae and stuff that was on there. Perhaps there wasn't much algae on the sea floor. Again, you have to think, well, what does that mean? And we do know that there's a lot of, uh, there isn't a lot of creatures that actually live right on the sea floor. There are a lot of swimming things, but not on the sea floor. So maybe there was not much oxygen. Uh, maybe, the, maybe it was a bit too acidic. There was something about that sea floor that was just a little bit difficult a lot of the times for some creatures to live on. But we have new snails there, gastropods there, so we'll see what that tells us. Uh, ostracods. Uh, again, new, never been found here before. This is a modern one, just to tell you what an ostracod is. They're essentially arthropods in shells. These are tiny, a couple of millimeters as well. So you've got something like a little insect or a crab, whatever you want, to, an insect, uh, you know, an arthropod, jointed legs, and they live inside these two shells. And here's a modern one. And uh, these are the antennae sticking out, so the legs would stick out. They can move around. Um, Again, they're very common in the world today. They're all over the place, every environment. They're very useful for looking at ancient environments when you find them. Um, never known before here, and now we have these ones. Quite different to what we just showed you, but again, these are very small. That's a millimeter scale there, a couple of millimeters there. That's about the biggest at three millimeters. And I've only found a few of these. I think I've got eight or nine in total specimens. But what's really interesting is out of that eight or nine, there's at least four different kinds. So while the number of specimens is very low, the diversity is actually really, really high. So again, this is very new. I'm not quite sure what that all means, but I'm working with uh, Malcolm Hart, who is a micropaleontologist uh, in uh, the Geopark in Riviera, Geopark in the UK. Um, so we'll see what we come up with on these. But again, it's very new. They haven't been found in Clare before. Now this one, I don't even know where to begin with this thing. Um, this is something called Sphenotalus. What they are is enigmatic phosphatic tubes currently assigned to the night area, that is jellyfish and corals. So, you know, this is a couple of centimeters long. You can see millimeter scale here. There are these odd little tubes. They're very, very simple in some ways. Um, they're known for a long time. There's only one other record of them in Ireland, and that's a record going back to 1845. There's one specimen, maybe two fragments up in the Natural History Museum. I found uh, maybe 150 of these. So it's a whole new fauna, something we didn't know about before. Again, the only other location known from them in Ireland, uh, and I'm working with a couple of authors on those as well. They're really interesting because nobody quite knows what they are. And for a long time, when they were found initially uh, back in 18, whatever it was, when they were named first, um, people said they were plants, because they look a bit like plants, sure, you know, you find them. There. Then somebody else said, no, no, they can't be plants, they're phosphatic, and they're probably worm tubes. And we know that there are worms that live them that make tubes around themselves, and then somebody else said, no, they're not that. So there's a lot of kind of going back and forth for a long time, and then somebody finally said, well, look, there, there could be these um, essentially parts of jellyfish. So you think that doesn't look at like a jellyfish, but hold on a second. This is just a close-up showing sometimes you get these things branching off, and this is what they think we think they look like. But jellyfish, well, polyps. So jellyfish have a complex life cycle, and some of them create these, part of the life cycle is to generate polyps like this. So these are things that attach, they grow up along, and then they can bud off and reproduce like that. So this is a scyphozoan polyp, fossil sphenotalus, and that's one of the reasons why people are assigning these odd-looking things to the group that has jellyfish in them. So scyphozoans, we think they might be polyps of scyphozoans. Not everybody's 100% convinced, but it's the best um, idea we have at the minute. So what I've been finding, and again, that's not published yet, it's in a work in progress, is some very, very new stuff in these fossils that nobody's ever seen before in these, in Sphenotalus. Um, and it's, it may well end up being a whole new genus, so we might have to call it something different rather than Sphenotalus. But again, a whole new fauna of them, um, and within that fauna, lots of new stuff that's going to tell us a lot about the evolution of these creatures. It, from what I've seen so far, I don't know if we're going to be able to debate that too much in what I found, but nevertheless, uh, new information. Uh, bryozoans then. Bryozoans are common in the limestone, never before found in the shales. They come in a variety of different forms. They're alive and well today. They grow in all sorts of environments. They form colonies. So each of these, there's an individual bryozoa, and they form these massive colonies. Sometimes they encrust like this. Sometimes they form branch things like corals. They can form these glutinous masses um, as well. So they're a hugely diverse group, but we haven't found them in the shales uh, until recently. And here's the ones I found. 
working with um, Patrick Wise Jackson up in the University of Open Trinity College Dublin, who is one of the world's leading experts on fossil bryozoans. And he, the few I found are so completely different, but they're all bryozoans in different forms. And they do have a wide range of, of um, habitat that they live in and, and lifestyle. So again, no names for these yet. That's a work in progress, but it's new. Um, horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are alive today. Their ancestors were alive an awful long time ago. Um, this is what they look like. They have a kind of a carapace like this. They have a body here and then a tail. They're, you know, they're related to crabs. They're not crabs. They're xiphosurans. Um, but this is what they look like. In particular, see the legs under here. They've got this series of feet for walking legs. The first ones are used for feeding. And then they've got this odd one down at the end, which is called a pusher foot. This is what it looks like when it's actually moving. I've got footprints, trackways with these. Here's the tail mark here. This is the feet walking along here. Um, not only have I got the, the footprints of them, the tracks, and I've got a couple of these, but we've actually got one body fossil as well, which I'm working with the guys in um, Paris Museum of Natural History on that. They asked that I don't show it yet because they want to publish that. And they said, look, hold off on that for now, which is that's, but well, we do have a body fossil as well. Uh, which we're working on. But here's one of the actual imprints. So if we, you know, that's the trail with all the footprints here. If we zoom in on one of those footprints, this is the, the pattern here that tells us. So you can get lots of things, make similar trails. This is really telling us that what we've got is a xiphosurin. So it's a type of a horseshoe crab that was crawling around on the seafloor 320 million years ago. Again, um, never been found here before. Um, fish has just, how am I doing for time? Yeah, you're well over. <laughs> well over, yeah. There's a, I mean, yeah. So fish, I'm finding lots of bits of fish. There's one record going back to 1950s of a, um, a fish, bit of fish that was found. Um, that specimen is no longer available, so therefore scientifically it doesn't exist. Um, I've been finding loads of stuff. These are Sarcopterygian fish. Sarcopterygian fish are the ancestors of tetrapods. We are all tetrapods, so our history goes back to these. This bone here doesn't look like much. Again, a few centimeters long. Uh, this is a parasphenoid bone, so that's from the palate, the base of the skull, the upper part of the roof of the mouth of a fossil fish. And you've got these denticles on it that they use for you know, grinding up food or for feeding. Um, we found these tooth, call it a tooth, it's a fang, Sarcopterygian tooth, so that's a couple of centimeters long, so some of these fish are quite big. We get really beautifully preserved scales. So you get your Sarcopterygians, you get your act Actinopterygians are the fish we have today, pretty much. Uh, Sarcopterygians are quite rare. These are the common fish we have today, and we get scales, um, you know, quite a few variety of different types of scales. Uh, and something for next year. <laughs> I, 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 there is, believe me. Then we get these spines, we get another kind of fish then. These are Acanthodians. They're also known as spiny sharks. This isn't one I found, I'm just using this for reference. This, we find the spines, but nothing else of them. But the spines are quite like, ter you know, diagnostic and we can tell they're acanthodians. So we've got the sharks, the chondrichthians. So we've got the acanthodians, they're related to those. We've got the actinopterygians related to modern fish. And we've got the sarcopterygians, which are the ancestors of tetrapods. A couple of years back, like I said, there was no fish known in the clear shells. Now we've got pretty much the diverse group of all the known fish that are alive today. Uh, recorded in the Clare Shale. So the biodiversity was fairly impressive. And finally, I'm going to finish on this. It's, we're in the final throes of getting this paper. It's been accepted. We just have to make some um, modifications to the paper, which are pretty much done. This is something I found uh, was it two years ago now. Uh, it's a fossil sponge. What's remarkable about this is the size of it. That's the head of the hammer, this one here. I've got some here. But, um, so some of these things were this size. Um, uh, we're publishing it. It's the genus of Cyatophycus. We gave it a new species name, so it's a new species of sponge known from here, Balleri. We called it Balleri after Baller of the Evil Eye because when these things stood up, they had this range of spines around the top part here. So looking down on it would have looked like an eye looking up. Sponges are really simple creatures. Uh, they're made up of these spicules. In this case, these are kind of rectilinear spicules. They're kind of held together in a gelatinous mass. Uh, they sucked in water to the sides and put it out through the top, and then they filtered the food as it went in. Um, very, very odd. I was working with a guy, um, one of the world's leading experts on sponges, and I found a little bits of piece of sponge, and he was going, yeah, that's kind of interesting, but wasn't really getting them. And then I sent him this picture here, and he said, well, I won't tell you what he said, but basically he was, uh, he was over here uh, three, four weeks later. 
He said, wow, I've got to see that. So he came over um, and we've written the paper up. It's been accepted for publication. So extremely new, extremely odd, extremely interesting and extremely unexpected. But there you have it, we've got new sponges as well. And there is more stuff. So I'll say no more. We've got lots of interesting stuff. If you think you've found anything, just send me a picture. Info at Burn Geopark. I'm more than happy to look at pictures if you think you found something. And who knows, it might be new. Um, once Dave has finished speaking, um, I've got some examples of the fossils here. We can have a look at those in, in our own good time later, okay? Thank you, sorry I went on so long. <laughs> <laughs>